Janet Guthrie, world famous race car driver and just pleasant person that I now call a drinking buddy. If you could describe this dinner with racers in one word, what would it be? Extremely agreeable. Perfect. <laughs> and now for Dinner with Racers, presented by Continental Tire. With your hosts, Ryan Eversley and Sean Heckman. Placeholder Radio. <laughs> Welcome to Dinner with Racers. I'm Ryan Eversley, and I'm alongside my friend and partner, Sean Heckman. Hi. So we are currently driving to Los Angeles International Airport to drop Ryan off after a 40-day trip that went 12,000 miles across 29 states, driving a Honda Odyssey with uh, what kind of tire, Ryan? Got metal tire. Cross contact, LX20 and Continental and Honda and Ryan and I thought it would be great to deliver you a free podcast getting to know some of the coolest people in racing and of course if you're going to do that then you have to stop in Aspen Colorado to meet up with a living legend none other than Janet Guthrie for those who uh, don't know Janet Guthrie's statistics uh, she's won her class at the Sebring 12 hour She's raced at Daytona, but probably most significantly, she was uh, first the first woman to ever race at the Indianapolis 500 and then became the first woman to ever race at the Daytona 500. So truly uh, broke barriers, and uh, and she talks about that. But I think what uh, our listeners will appreciate is that kind of the, the very specific attitude she has about that. So it was truly an honor to get to sit down with Janet. I call her Janet because we're on a first-name basis now. She is my drinking buddy, as you'll learn in the episode. And one of the things that I took away from it was not that she was a female in racing or even really cared about that as much as she just wanted to be in racing. Couldn't have been more willing to give us some time. And we got to see Aspen where Sean and I stayed in a little kid's room. (laughs) Yeah, we won't mention the hotel because we thought we went big and it turned out to be a disaster. Uh, We actually talked about that in the episode, I think. Yeah. Um, But the uh, hotel that we should have stayed at was where the restaurant was, the Hotel Jerome which had an amazing, like, a smoking lounge that we thought we could eat at, but uh, it wasn't very good for the podcast. Uh, but we did eat in their bar. And uh, what did you have? And I believe I had a club sandwich and a glass of Chardonnay that Janet ordered for me. And I had a chicken sandwich. And it's important to note that uh, as we ate, Janet just took the headset right off when the food came and said, nope, time to eat. Time to eat. We're not doing that. <laughs> like, and yes, that. ma'am. Sorry. And one other side note before we jump into it. This should tell you everything you need to know about Janet Guthrie right here. Uh, When the conversation was over, she actually reached out to us to correct us on something that happened during the conversation. You will hear us mention on two different occasions that she won at the 12 Hours of Sebring. And she wanted to make sure that we clearly addressed that that is, in fact, not true. She did not win at Sebring. She won her class. I can't name anything anyone else in the world not just drivers i can't name anyone in the world who would be very quick to point out that you can't just say that they won the race that you have to point out that they won only in their class that is the modesty and awesomeness that is janet guthrie so before we turn it over we uh, we have to give one initial plug and you'll hear it throughout the episode uh, janet does have a book that you can purchase at janetguthrie.com and it tells stories way beyond the lunch that we had together uh, and, of course, a, a, a whole lot more. So check that out. But without further ado, Janet Guthrie. Meow. Meow. All right, we're going to start in five, four, three, two. Hi. Uh, oh, here we go. Here we go. How's it going? Hi there. Welcome. Hi, I'm Ryan. Nice to meet you. How are you? I'd you get well. up, but I'm kind of stuck. But uh, hi, nice to meet you. I'm Sean. So have a seat. Seat wherever you want. All right. So am I sounding okay? Yeah, you sound great. Yeah. So cheers. Thanks for joining yeah, us. Cheers. Absolutely. Pretty excited <laughs> about just drinking cheers. wine with you. So Chardonnay is that your is that is that your thing? Usually, yes. All right. Is that every red day? wine is much more interesting and complex, but it gives me a headache. So ah, okay, <laughs> okay. So this was like the uh, uh, we have a friend uh, who's not too far from here that um, 
coincidentally recommended that we come here to the Hotel Jerome for, for lunch, and then, of course, you recommended it. It was like, clearly, this is the place we're going to go. Uh, what uh, is this like the place that everybody that's local goes to for lunch or? Well, uh, certainly in the summer in the garden. Right. Um, I, it's it's uh, probably the best place for lunch. Uh, the Little Nell is a wonderful hotel right at the base of the ski slopes, very expensive. They used to have a fabulous chef who grew a lot of his own produce oh, wow. and oh, wow. yeah. served mostly organic. And uh, I don't know whether he quit or what. Ryan Hardy was his name. Okay. And since then, the kitchen at, at uh, the Little Nell has been sort of up and down. Okay. But this is uh, probably the best spot you could be at the moment. Okay, fair enough. In the off season, because yeah, so it's many the nicest, restaurants. No, it's are the closed. nicest place we've been on our whole tour <laughs> by, by <laughs> far. Two years. So, yeah. <laughs> this is our second years. year doing this. I, I don't think it get better. I mean, it's no Chick Fil A. Yeah. You know, uh, no. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can I get you to move that in just a little more toward there? That's good. That's good. So perfect. perfect. Okay. It doesn't seem to bend. It bends a little bit. There. There, there you go. Is that so better? That perfect. is much better, actually. Perfect. Awesome. Okay. So, Cool. So, Adam, so when did you move here? I've lived here full time since 1985. Okay. And uh, my late husband and I uh, bought our house in '87, and moved in at the beginning of '89. So it's been a long time. Yeah. Okay. Because we were thinking about this, like it's even in October, which I would argue is probably the, one of the quieter seasons for you guys. Um, it's really really nice but all we can think about is guys who are in racing is there's no airport near here so like if you're oh, traveling to oh and no, from racing no no it's right outside of town it's 10 oh, really? minutes from my house and it's like a commercial airport that you can yeah make? united okay. everything oh all yeah. right i'm moving here. yeah it's over <laughs> i'm done it's all packing up i'll be the second race car driver for <laughs> <laughs> yep. oh before i forget to tell you yeah if Independence Pass is still open, and I think it is, yeah. you need to check on okay. it, okay. however. Um, it's a fabulous way to get out of here, okay. uh, uh, provided you're not afraid of narrow roads with precipices not off with the driving, side. No. <laughs> <It's fine. laughs> uh, the same friend that reco re recommended this restaurant also said, because we're going to be going to Denver tonight, was uh, like, if you can take the pass, you got to do it because this time of year it's going to be just beautiful. Yeah. So that's kind of what we were thinking too. Very right. spectacular right. and a lot shorter than going back to Glenwood and uh, along okay. the expressway. Right. Yeah, well, that helps too. <laughs> so you've, you've been out of a race car for a few years, but when you're driving a pass like that, is it, is it, are you, are you, uh, statute of limitations? So 366 <laughs> days ago, uh, <laughs> Where, do, do you still get a little aggressive? No, uh, like I always say, driving on the street is transportation and racing is a sport, and okay. never the two should be confused. Fair enough. That's okay. great advice. That's great advice. Yeah, <laughs> that's actually true. Yeah, my father used to say what that. What if it's a rental car, though? Uh, no. It okay. doesn't make any difference. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not one of those people that drove a rental car into a swimming pool in the okay. 1950s. <laughs> <laughs> My dad had that story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll never introduce you to our friend Andy. Um, My dad used to say that the best driver is one whose passengers never have an uneasy or uncomfortable moment. And I think that's true. Oh, well, then I'm then not your best terrible. driver. <laughs> not your best <laughs> driver. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I mean, obviously you've traveled the world, but uh, uh, what about Aspen was what's what brought you here? Well, um, uh, I drove my last major race, the Daytona 500 of 1980, and spent the next, had spent every year since 78, trying to find sponsorship to continue at the right. top levels, and couldn't do it. And I, I said, you know, if you keep this up, you're going to jump out of a high window. So I said, well, it's time to start working on the book. And yeah. um, I knew I couldn't write a book in Manhattan. And I said to myself, well, you've always said that the closest accessible experience to 
racing is skiing. So why don't you go to a ski town? Oh, okay. So I came out and looked at ski towns right. in Colorado, and once you've seen Aspen, there yeah, isn't any place else. <laughs> gorgeous. It's so nice. Yeah, I, I never uh, knew that I would end up staying here right. indefinitely. And do you ski competitively or anything like that? No, not not competitively, um, just recreationally. Sure, because I, mean, I assume it translates pretty well <laughs> to car racing. Yeah, um, it, it does. I mean, you're exercising a skill in an environment that poses certain hazards and right. the fun of it is to do it well and uh, sticking with the the local theme we met Dalton one of the managers here and he told us a really neat story about how he's been to one Indy 500 and it was one of the ones that you were entered in and we were kind of laughing at the the like you know coincidence yeah. that's there because he's only been here for a couple of years he was saying and you've been here for a long time and then he told us another story about how a young Argentinian kid who's a big F1 fan was here and you were having lunch a couple months ago and he followed the sport enough, and when, when Dalton pointed out, like, yeah, that, that lady right there is the first female to race Daytona and Indy and all that, the kid was just blown away by it. Yeah. <laughs> so do you get recognized often? I used to. Yeah. Uh, but it's been a very long time. Sure. Uh, this is 40 years now since I first went to Indianapolis. And, uh, yeah, I get recognized for a long, long time. but. Right. It's been a longer time than that. Sure, yeah. sure. One of the things that I think about is that fame now is very easy to come by if you're willing to post something a little crazy on the internet or be on a reality TV show. And back in your day, there weren't these options. So being the first female to do anything of, of that caliber was a big opportunity. Did you get to meet famous people, go to famous places because of that, to come and do press? And my, uh, the first thing I thought was, I bet she's met a president. Yeah. You know, she's probably got invited to the White House. Well, that's true. I did um, get to meet Jimmy Carter, whom I is. admired a great deal, and um, and things of that sort uh, did happen, yes, at the time. But I was really n never very interested in being famous. Outside in fact, it, right. not at all interested right, right. in being <laughs> famous. I, what I wanted to do was drive race cars yeah. at the top level. I loved it. It was a passion and obsession. Right. And I was, I, I, I would have walked over hot coals barefoot from yeah. New York to California to get the chance to drive an Indy car right, and a right. NASCAR cup car. And I did get that chance. I just wish it had gone on longer. Sure, sure. Well, actually, so there was a, on that note, the, there was a quote I heard on a, uh, an old video of yours um, back to sort of not really caring about the celebrity side of it. And it was, you felt like you had a sense of responsibility forced upon you. Um, and I know I like that quote a lot because what that says to me is you didn't set out to drive to be the first woman at the Indy 500, or the first woman. You just wanted to race at Indy. You didn't give a crap about that part of it. So um, is that true, first of all? But That's absolutely true. I, people ask me how I got started, and I always say I was born adventurous and grew up insufficiently socialized. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds familiar. Okay. I know those guys. Yeah. <laughs> and Chris, yeah. Um, I uh, started out flying when yeah. I was very young. Uh, yeah, because you started flying at like 13. Yeah, How does that even much. happen? Uh, I started putting time in my logbook when I was 13. But, but, but how, like, how does that happen? Like, you can't just at 13 just walk into a plane and turn on the ignition. Like, did uh, Well, my, my father flew for Eastern Airlines. Okay, okay. Um, and you, lived in, you grew up in Iowa? I, no, okay. I was born in Iowa, but we moved to Miami when ah, I was okay. about uh, three or four years old. Okay. So Miami is what has always felt like. It's kind of your home, okay. Yeah. And um, Dad had had an instructor's rating, but um, I would beg him for flying lessons, and, and eventually we'd go fly, and I'd do things wrong, and he'd yell, and I'd cry. <laughs> <laughs> and when I got over it, <laughs> I'd beg for flying lessons again. But I was very relieved when I got turned over to someone whose instructor's rating was current. Okay. <laughs> and probably wouldn't yell as much. Right. So, uh, so I soloed when I was 16 made a parachute jump when I was 16. That was my first big adventure. That's awesome. Um, wow. And um, by the time I got out of college, I had a f flight instructor's rating and a commercial pilot's license. Right. And you, you, you graduated with the college part, but you went to college to get a bachelor's in physics. 
You well, didn't go for like a marketing degree or whatever BS thing like somebody like me has. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't call that BS. No, it's BS. He's so nice. <laughs> <laughs> like, you don't have to be nice, trust me. It's, it's, it's nonsense. Um, actually, I picked the University of Michigan out of a book for aeronautical engineering okay. because back then women couldn't fly for the military, women sure. couldn't fly for the airlines. Sure. So I picked the closest thing. Which was to work in aviation as, a, as an engineer. Just so. Okay. Um, and I, I spent my freshman year in the College of Engineering drawing pictures of the threads on screws and mixing yeah. up batches of concrete, sand, and gravel and decided that wasn't really what I had in mind. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> so I changed to a physics major, and that's how I graduated. Right. And then, ironically, I got hired by Republic Aviation, and my job title was Research and Development Engineer. Okay, okay. Now, that's, that kind of thing is rare for, for females in 2016, but because sure. this was late 60s, 70s? This was, uh, I was a freshman in college in 1955. Okay. So, like, were you the lone female? I mean, was this a, it had to be fairly rare. I think there were something like eight women in the freshman class of something like 2000 in the College wow. of Engineering. Right. Wow. So it wasn't, it wasn't unique. So you could have your pick of any number of nerds. Very popular. Uh, uh, no, not huh? necessarily, okay. <laughs> because uh, it was an oddball sort of thing. Sure, sure. Um, but um, I, got, I got a really good education at Michigan, and um, I had come there from spending my entire life in a private girls' school with a graduating class of 15. Yeah. So I was sort of a fish out of water at <laughs> Michigan. So obviously the daredevil side of you existed way before car racing ever showed up. Yeah, I was born so, that way. Right. I That's mean, I was... 20 and I was commercialing from Miami up to Chicago to bring back a Cessna 175 to Miami, that kind of thing. Um, as I like a job, like as a side job or? Well, uh, I didn't do a lot of it, but I was really tickled every time I got hired to do sure. something like that. Sure. Flying from Miami to Michigan? Uh, well, uh, on a commercial airplane to okay. pick up a Cessna 175 okay. at Meg's Field, which yeah. doesn't exist any longer, okay. uh, on the lakefront in Chicago, uh, pick up that airplane there and bring it back to Miami. Like flying it back. You're basically, yeah. the, you're a hired gun yeah, to yeah, transport yeah. the plane back right, at, at exactly. 25 20. Sorry, 20. Wow, that's... <laughs> Excuse you, Ryan. I wouldn't do that now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want some 20-year-old kid flying my plane, you know? That's pretty impressive. Well, I had a certain reputation at the local airport. Okay. For the wine. Of being safe? Oh. For, or of being... For being a good pilot. You can let her in. She ain't going to do anything. Yeah. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah. Don't let Eversley in. Yeah, don't so let me near it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's fair. So at 20, you're flying across the country up a great distance, and I'm assuming a Cessna 175 is... Not much different than a 172 of now? It's bigger. Okay. Uh, not much bigger, okay. a little bigger. So smaller smaller mm -hmm. aircraft, and this is a long time ago, and they're like, yeah, here, let this 20-year-old kid fly it back for you, no problem. That has to instill some confidence in you that you're being trusted with other people's airplanes and, and with that great distance to cover as well at that age. Well, I had the confidence. Yeah. I mean, I knew what I could do, yeah. and so I, I really wasn't very concerned about it. Sure. But this was able to give you the money to go out and f buy your first sports car? No. Oh, uh, okay. No. Um, I, I didn't really make a lot of money ferrying okay. airplanes, but I sure enjoyed it when I got the chance <laughs> to do that. Sure. I, I ferried Stearman's. I ferried the Stearman Crop Duster. That's oh, the wow. big okay. open cockpit, yeah. two-place World War II trainer right. uh, biplane. Yeah. Snoopy. I was Snoopy. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, no, I um, got out of college. I was still driving my the car that Dad had given me for my senior year, which okay. was a 47 Plymouth with, oh, that car Just was such a giant a boat. Yeah, sure. um, <laughs> I, and so now I have a job, right. a job that paid in today's dollars a little over $1,000 a week. Back then it was $125 <laughs> a week. That's out of college that's kind of money. That's yeah. fine, yeah. Okay. Um, my 
my favorite professor, when I told him how much I was going to be making, said, I've never made that much. <laughs> <laughs> and this whole time was racing in your life, not necessarily driving, no. but like, were you a no. fan? Were you no. following it? No, no. Flying was my That plan. was your yeah. passion. Okay. Uh, and I, I kept on doing a little instructing after okay. I went to work at Republic. There was a private field immediately adjacent to the Republic Airport. Um, anyway, um, so I needed a car. Actually, somebody offered me a half share in an AT-6, which was a World War II training plane, two-place, low-wing monoplane, stressed for 6 Gs positive and 6 Gs negative. Oh, wow. You Especially could do outside 50s, yeah. loops. Yeah, uh, right. You could do all sorts of wonderful stuff with an AT-6. <laughs> and so I drove out there, and I looked at it, and I thought about a half share for $650 back then. Wow. Uh, they sell in the, I don't know, $100,000 right. category now, right. I think. And I said, but where could I go to have fun with this plane? Because it's Long Island. It's all traffic control zones. Right, you can't uh, go around doing aerobatics. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's no place where you can go and do outside loops and right. whatnot. Right, right. So I went away and I bought a seven-year-old Jaguar instead. And that was the XK120? That was the XK120 Coupe, nice. yes. Right. Uh -huh. And that kind of starts the racing stuff. That was the big yeah. watershed, yeah. right? And obviously you had an engineering background, but were you, you know, there's... Mechanically there's, there's Yeah, there's, there's engineers who are good with paper uh, at the time, and there's engineers who are actually good at uh, turning wrenches. So were you more of a mechanical type, or were you... More well, theoretical. It was it was rather a combination. Um, I I mean I was sort of the all purpose junior grade physicist when something okay. arrived in the house that nobody knew anything about. I would go down to the library and, and become the out. instant expert. Yep. Okay, <laughs> understood. <laughs> um, I but um, driving that Jaguar to work every day, um, I saw bunch of cars at a restaurant on the way between my house and Republic and one day I stopped in and saw posted uh, a little poster for something called a Gymkhana. I right. didn't even know how to pronounce it. Right. <laughs> they call it solo competition now. Right. It would be like uh, auto crossing today. Uh, it's, yes. Yeah. Um, so back then um, uh, department stores were all closed on Sundays so we would get the big lot at Macy's at Roosevelt right. Field or whatnot. And hay bales. And set yeah. up. A, no, no hay bales. Just a course with rubber pylons. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. And cool. you got a chance to walk through the course first, and then you would go through this course as fast as you could in your sports car. Right. It was, uh, it was a lot of fun. And, that, and that's a cool kind of way to start because horsepower doesn't matter in a track that tight. It's all about just getting as much as you can out of each corner. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So. Exactly. Cool. And then I found out about hill climbs, and after that, I discovered sports car racing. So right. one thing led to another. And then, but see that because that's that's the interesting part to me. So first of all, have you looked up Jim Conna videos today? No. Okay. There's a <laughs> <laughs> uh, quite different. I'll send you a link. Um, <laughs> the, the name has been brought back. There is a. Uh, 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 a driver named Ken Block who started DC Shoes and now he uh, goes out and does rally racing and whatnot. He's brought the name back, but now he does all this stunt driving around the streets of San Francisco sure, and Hollywood yeah. sets and stuff like that. I'll send you a video. It's probably a little different than what you did in, in your Jaguar, but it'll make sense when you see it. Uh, but, uh, you know, so your, your first big accomplishments in racing came in sports car, and Ryan and I are both more sports car guys than anything. Um, so, like, you won Sebring... In your class in 67 and 70, I believe. Uh, 70 and also another year. I think it was 67. 67, yeah. I think, yeah. yeah. But that's a big jump from effectively modern autocrossing. Yeah. Um, so, he, like, I, I'm pretty sure you didn't just go from autocrossing and go, hey, guys, I'm ready at Sebring. Let's go. So, <laughs> like, what, no. like, no, you of have to, not. where did the money come from? I mean, how did, how did you get to, to that level of, of competition? Well, um, I. Um, because in my head, once you're at Sebring, the path to Indy or Daytona is a lot simpler, but getting those first couple breaks right. to get to the big professional endurance races. Well, of course, all this I was funding myself. Right. That's um, what I'm saying. So I, I ran Gymkhana's in 61 and 62, and by then I had discovered sports car racing. Right. 
and I bought another Jaguar, an XK140, that had been set up for a CCA racing. Right. And had a roll bar, the required roll bar, although the one that car had probably would have made a better plow if the car had <laughs> turned upside down. <laughs> Makes sense. And um, went to a sports car club of America driver's school in March of 1963 and got my uh, beginner's license and finished the required six races and so on and so forth and got my national. And so I competed in SCCA in 63, 4, 5, 6. And this is all self-funded. And 7, all funded on my salary. And since my salary wasn't really quite adequate for that yeah kind of let's say like were you living in their car how did you pay how, how <laughs> exactly like, yeah okay <laughs> that, that sounds like a lot of sacrifice uh well i learned how to build engines right. uh, in fact the first engine i ever built i put together in the back of my station wagon nice with the help of a torque wrench borrowed from the gas station across the street that wow. kind of thing well, where were you living at the time like i, like I out long island okay um about Half an hour from where I worked, 40 okay. minutes maybe. Yeah. And um, I actually... That and, would you, and you would drive this car to the track. There was no towing it and putting it on a flatbed. No, initially I drove it to the track. <laughs> <yes>. Okay. <laughs> a little different from today. Um, after my first issue with a car that ended a race weekend in a non-running condition, Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I fitted up my antique uh, station wagons with a tow hitch and flat towed it. Okay. And eventually I had a... Uh, um, a proper trailer. A trailer. Okay. Yeah. So for the, for the racer today, that's such a lesson in being grateful for what you're able to do. Yeah. Because there's so many... Ent entitlement's a pretty strong word that's used today, pretty common, especially in motorsports, probably yeah. all sports. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, go-karts are now coming in in massive... Trailers with, with 15 carts all aligned along the right. side. So it's a little different from building your own engine out of the back of a station wagon. Right, so. right. But you're doing that because you love it so much. You're, you're happy to be spending that money, happy to spend that time because it's your true passion. Exactly. Yeah. I would do anything I had right. to in order to get to the next race. Yeah, right. Exactly. That's so cool. Now, do you watch IMSA racing today? Not really. I'm not much of a spectator. Sure. I can get behind that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so like things, so like modern, like Sebring today, where we have four different classes and forced amateur rankings and things like that. That's all kind of stuff that you're not, you don't pay that much attention to. I'm I'm not really familiar with how it works uh, okay. at the moment. Although there was something of the sort back then. Uh, the first time I drove the Daytona 24 Hour in 1966. Um, it was on a Sunbeam Alpine. That little car couldn't oh, get wow. out of its own way. <laughs> <laughs> and and here were these Ferrari prototypes and yeah. whatnot. Yeah. So, so you had to drive with eyes in the back of your sure. head. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and make sure that you gave the fast car as a, a clean shot on through. Right, right. Uh, it, I, I think it's tougher driving a really slow little car in an event like that when you have than fast prototypes going by driving right. a car yeah. that is capable of running up right. front well especially i assume the cars are in this, at that time were so fragile compared to today that you had to really really baby the car in addition to looking behind you so like right now in the, the slow class so to speak at daytona would be what's called the gtd class which are still very very fast cars uh, but the cars are so bulletproof the guys can just rocket through the gears and not have to worry about brakes and whatnot so yeah they're worried about the cars coming behind it but they're not babying the car in the process and i assume 1965 this is a very very, very different era in, in that sense but well everything was different back then i mean in the 70s when i got my chance at the top levels uh, there were a lot of races uh, that ended, ended with only the winning car on the lead right. lap. Uh, it's right. quite different now. We were yeah. not driving spec racers back right. then. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, when, uh, uh, I mean, keeping the, the NASCAR and the IndyCar stuff out for now, when you, when you first made the transition, so you're this club racer, effectively, who's been doing Gymkhana's, and you're now doing some of the big national events, Sebring and Daytona. Um, 
was there a lot of female presence at that time in that kind of racing? In Sports Car Club of America, being a woman just really wasn't a big deal. Okay. Uh, okay. Which suited me just fine. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, a, a I think there were there other female drivers, or just no one really cared. No, there were there were quite a few women. Uh, let me see. Denise McCluggage was semi-retired by the time I came along, but there was Pat Marnone, Donna Mae Mims. Oh, uh, this is really reaching a long way back. So, um, at any SCCA race I went to, there were usually, not always, but usually, <coughs> one or two other drivers. And so it just wasn't this a big was. deal. Yeah, no, that's probably pretty similar to today, actually. So. At that time when you're doing the Daytona 24 hours and doing the Sebring 12 hours, you, you have teammates. Yes. Were you teamed up with anybody that went on to become a world-famous driver of sorts, or was it other people paying to drive that went somewhere, didn't go anywhere, anything that strikes a memory? I was telling you about that first engine I ever yeah. built with my own hands. Yeah. Um, that engine went something like 12 races in 1964, of which the best was the first ever 500-mile um, or six-hour race at Watkins Glen. Ah, okay. And still around today. Sports Car Club of, of America National Championship back then was the biggest thing in the country right. after, after Grand Prix. Okay. A and... Um, I had a co-driver named Dick Mooney. We had gone oh, to driver's cool. school together. Yeah. And <laughs> we finished sixth overall against wow. Cobras and Corvettes nice. and whatnot. Wow. With this first engine I ever built myself. Nice. <laughs> okay. So I felt <laughs> proud of that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, like, there was no team engineer or anything, correct? Like, really ah. primarily. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Did you guys ever ever get in arguments about setup? And then you just like, did you bring your degree with you? Setup. What was that? Okay. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> I like that. You applied to be an astronaut. Is that around the same time? That was in '64. Uh, okay. okay. And what I applied for was the first scientist astronaut program. Okay. I mean, I was you know a test pilot and all yeah. that, like uh, like the original seven, but. Um, one of my coworkers came into my office at Republic one day uh, with um, a copy of the specs for applying for the first scientist astronaut program. And he said, look, he said, with the possible exception of a PhD, you meet all these specs, the pilot's license, this, that, and the other. Uh, he said, if you'd, the stuff you've been doing here the last few years, if you'd done it at a university, you'd have a PhD. Why don't you apply? Yeah. I thought, well, that is perfectly ridiculous. <laughs> 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 but I, I bounced the idea off some of my colleagues, and they said, give it a shot. Right. And I got through the first round of eliminations. And then I got cut at the second round sure. of eliminations, but I have a, a letter from Deke Slayton, uh, one of the original that's seven, so that's cool. Yeah. saying, you know, nice try, don't call us, we'll call you. <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, that, that that's really pretty cool. That yeah. sets the tone for your personality that you're, you know, flying around the country at 20 years old by yourself, you're parachuting at 16. And then when someone says, hey, they're looking for astronauts, you're like, yeah, I could do that. Yeah. Like, that's not normal. <laughs> well, <and> it, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that's it, not normal. All I'm hearing this whole time is, like, you, you're not trying to break barriers. You're just doing the stuff you want to do. Exactly. And I yeah. dig that. Yeah. But, but also, fear isn't a thing. Yeah. <laughs> you're like, yeah, no I could do that. Astronaut, sure. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> sure. Parachute, let's do it. <laughs> like, that doesn't, that's not normal. You know, most people have that fear of even attempting things. Not only are you not afraid of attempting things, you're like, yeah, that's the scariest job in the world at the time. I'd like to try that. <laughs> that's pretty. That's <laughs> so <Well>, awesome. <laughs> it was. It was not a matter of of fear, sort of thing. I mean, you have to have respect for the situation yeah, you're sure. in. But well, that's why you're still here. <laughs> <laughs> it was a matter of finding out what it was like out there at the 
borders of human capability. Yeah. And the fact that I was born into an age where the broad shoulders and big muscles didn't matter, yeah. Yeah. where you had this fabulous machinery to deal with, made it possible for me as a woman to find out what it was like out right. there at those borders. Sure. And, uh, and that's what I loved, really. That's absolutely. So, absolutely. That's so perfectly said. And yeah, to be, to be sort of in the science aerodynamic, aeronautic motorsport field in the 60s and 70s when we were really breaking ground on, yeah. you know, going to the moon and learning about ground effects in race cars and that sort of thing. I mean, it's such a well, different era from Airplane now. technology is going crazy. Uh, yeah, you exactly. Know. Well, but on that sort of fearlessness level, like when you're uh, uh, with your, it, you know, when, you're, when your husband was here, was that, uh, like, normally you can't have two fearless people in a couple. Was he the more sensible one and you were the one who was always going flat down the, uh, the ski slope? No, it, well, he didn't like skiing uh, because, after all, he might break his arm and then he couldn't fly. Okay. Uh, and okay. he felt so that he was, was a pilot. He was. Uh, he flew. He was a captain with American Airlines. Okay. And he felt about flying like I felt about racing. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. we okay. understood each other. Okay. <laughs> That's great. And if he's traveling all the time, you probably only saw so much of each other. Um, it, it, it's true, but of course I was used to that. My father yeah, but say you, been there's a lot of independence pilot. I'm hearing, so that's probably probably worked for you. And I didn't marry until late. Right. Uh, so um, he was a really good guy. I miss him. Sure. You win C bring twice. Um, from what I know, you know you you are finishing high at Daytona in a car that shouldn't be finishing that high. Was the Indy 500 calling? Was this something you just had to do, or was it more of something where opportunities started coming together? No, opportunity knocked at my at my door. Um, the end of 75, um, if I remember right, and I had one used up race car. I had no savings. I was in debt. I was so you were a race car driver. <laughs> normal, normal, <laughs> yeah. normal, normal race car. Sounds very car familiar. Right. So, okay. And I was saying to myself, you know, you really must come to your senses and right. start making you were some provision. How old? You're probably late 20s at this point. I was at that time. I was 37. Oh, okay. Um, and as I said, I. Um, said to myself, you know, you really must come to your senses and start it's making some provision for your old that, age. That's my age now. <laughs> and that's all we've been talking about on the road trip is, am I making good decisions yeah, with my life? And the answers here. are no. Yeah, so. think long term. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, <laughs> go ahead. And um, at that point, I got home from working on the car one night, and there was a message on my answering machine. And yes, I did have an answering machine <laughs> back then. <laughs> And it said, uh, this is uh, Rala Volstead in Portland, Oregon. How yeah. would you like to take a shot at the Indianapolis 500? And I said to myself, yeah, right, another joker. Right, um, sure, yeah. Sure. yeah. I, because a couple of women drivers had gotten egg on their faces by announcing they were going to go to Indianapolis, and then it never and happened. And then it materialized. Right. So the next morning... I called up Chris Economaki, who is gone now, but he was the guru. He right. would be uh, like in modern era, that'd be like Bob Varsha or Calvin Fish. Uh, maybe or Lee like Diffie. Robin Miller. Yeah, to an extent. Yeah, no, yeah. not Robin Miller. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh. Well, we're getting into that later. <laughs> yeah, that's coming back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, Chris was the editor uh, and publisher of National Speed Sport News, right. and he knew what was going to happen to every race driver in the country before they knew themselves. Okay, yeah. So I called up Chris, and I said, Chris, who is Rala Volstead? And Chris filled me in on his background and assured me that he was real. Right. He had been bringing cars to Indianapolis for a number of years at that point, and although he wasn't a front runner, uh, his cars had always made the field, almost always made right. the field. And it was a very low budget kind of program. Oh, he built his race cars in Oregon in the garage of his house. Oh, wow. Was he renting seats at the time or was he kind of paying for the, in other words, like were most of the cars he brought with pay guys that were just, uh, was he making no, a living off of this? No, or this was there was very little of that back okay. then. Okay. Uh, some, but not a lot. Um, his driver the previous year had been Tom Bigelow, the all-time sprint car racing champion, yeah. Yeah. until just lately somebody beat him by one. <laughs> uh, okay. Tom was a super nice guy. 
And um, so we had a conversation, and um, I said, okay, here's, here's the deal. We have a private test, and if I like you and you like me and the car goes fast enough and I can make it go fast enough, then you can make all the noise about it you feel like you want to. But until then, it's our secret. And I like that approach that's so a lot. That's so not what we do today. Now everyone makes a big deal and then before it's ever shown up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it sounds like that was happening then too, that there were, you know, without making any modern day analogies, right. there were programs were like, we're going to be the first woman and then they just never showed up, right? Because they, they were sort of doing that, if we announce it, we hope it will come kind of mentality. Uh, whereas you were the exact opposite. Rala said, oh, I, I don't know if the sponsor will be willing to pay for that. And I said, well, nevertheless, those are my terms. And so um, we did the test at Ontario, California in March of 76. And it was successful. And Rala had brought his number one driver, Dick Simon. I Dick Simon, the driver. Dick yeah. Simon. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, unless Dick Simon approved of me, uh, there was not going to be any deal. So he was the guy. He was like the lead person for this team. Well, Rala knew his stuff. Rala okay. built his own cars. He sat on the USAC board. Uh, he was also, is, a very, very good guy. Um, and so... The test was successful, and um, and we announced the program in March of '76, if I if I uh, remember correctly, and I had no idea what a commotion it was going to cause. <laughs> so March, of, and then the race was. Seven, do you, so do you do this a year and change in advance of the event, or you did this two two months before you N went out? No, this is. Um, we did the test in. <coughs> I'm sorry. We did the test in February, if yeah. I remember correctly, and announced the program in, in Indianapolis March, right. in March. For a May event. For a May event. Yeah. That's so what? unheard of today. <laughs> Three months before, not 14 months before. Yeah. What yeah. a hullabaloo. <laughs> what a commotion. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't believe it. We, we did it at the, um, uh, they had Bryant Heating and Cooling was the sponsor. Sure. Uh, they had been Rolla's sponsor for a long time. And they did a press conference at the Columbia Club on Monument Circle in Indianapolis. Right. And, and, and up to this point, you probably, you weren't a known name, maybe in, within certain motorsport circles, but it wasn't like anybody in the country knew the name Janet Cuthbert. No, right. no, no, right. no. Before we were even out on the street, the afternoon newspaper, which no longer exists, <laughs> right. was out with a blue streak edition with Dick and my picture on the front page. I, and that was just the beginning. Right. <laughs> wow. Okay. I was astonished. Right. I mean, yeah. I'm and at this point, you haven't even turned a lap at Indy, correct? No, no. Yeah. Oh. Never even saw it except when I went to be interviewed by <laughs> right. Bryant Heating and Cooling so right. they could make sure oh, that's that intimidating. <laughs> the backs of my hands didn't have calluses where they dragged along the ground when I walked. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, their PR guy had a had a Pinto, and he took me over and showed me the track for the very first time. Right. Fancy, yeah, fancy, good, yeah. Um, the PR guy had a bad car. I like it. <laughs> 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 anyway, um, so between then and the first IndyCar race I drove, which was right at the beginning of May at Trenton, um, May of '76. Um, the newspapers absolutely went bananas, yeah. and the drivers went bananas. Um, Rolla told me there were drivers in the USAC director's office pounding on the desk, telling him that their blood was going to be on his hands. So, and that, that's my I, question. I, when you say people <laughs> were going bananas, tell me what bananas means, because bananas can mean people are just excited. Or it could mean they're like, this is a bad idea. We can't let them in, you know. So what, what, <laughs> what, 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 where in the spectrum was the most of the, the hoopla? Women don't have the strength. Women don't have the endurance. So it was all negative. Women don't have the emotional stability. Women are going to endanger our lives. Wow. 
Um, it, it and was these were like published newspaper things, yeah, like editorial art. Yeah, yeah. Wow. I mean, it was, it was, frankly, it was awful. The only yeah, way you could do terrible. that today would be if you ran for president. <laughs> <laughs> like, that would be the only way you could say a comment like that. <laughs> anyway. I, it was a really terrible period yeah. of time because the only way you could deal with that was on the racetrack. Right. And my first race was going to be at Trenton. Right. It's originally scheduled for the end of April, postponed right. by rain and run the first weekend of May, just a week before the track opened right. for practice at Indianapolis. So all I could do was point to my record and say, just wait and see. Yeah, you've won Sebring, you've done all these other things. Um, just wait right. until you see what I can do on the track and then make your mind up. Right. Didn't help. <laughs> 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 it was a very stressful period yeah. of time. How did Trenton go? Uh, Trenton went well. I qualified right next to Dick Simon. Okay. Mm. Uh, somewhere just a little back of the middle of the field, okay. if I remember right. Okay. Um, and uh, ran well until the... Um, uh, transmission housing broke, the transaxle housing fractured. Okay. Um, and so that was the beginning. And right. uh, USAC was to decide whether or not I would be allowed to practice at Indianapolis okay. based on that race. Right. Sure. And from what you're describing, Volstead, I would say, would maybe be like a modern day Dale Coyne minus the rental rides. So my point is, like, it seems sounds like you did about where those cars should have been. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm, pretty so. much. Um, I, I, you know, uh, some of this is in my book, and I'll, I'll recommend it to you. It was we published in 05. Please plug the heck out of it. So you have a book. <laughs> it's on Amazon. I spent a long time writing this book. It is now out of print, but okay. you can still get copies from Amazon or by going to my website. JanetGuthrie.com. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. Thank you. We'll thank provide you. a link. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, and... Um, I spent a long time writing it. Right. It was not ghostwritten. And uh, every morning I would get up, get my X-Acto knife, make a little slit in my wrist, dip in the <laughs> quill pen, <laughs> <laughs> and begin. Well, because, and correct me if I'm wrong, but like, you're a doer. You're somebody who wants to get out and just do whatever it is, the thing that you're doing. So I assume sitting home and just writing it maybe isn't necessarily what you want to be doing with your time. Well, it was it was an important thing for me to do. Sure. And I picked Aspen because I thought, well, I'll write in the morning and I'll go ski in the afternoon. Okay. And that combination... That sounds like a great day. That's ...often yeah. worked well. <laughs> Although sometimes I threw myself on the sofa with the back of my hand to my forehead and said, I need a drink. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So a Tuesday for Sean or I. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, a normal day. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because in order to write it, I had to reinstall in myself the mindset that existed while I was doing it. Right. And um, that was taxing. Yeah. That, that could, I can imagine yeah. that. And sometimes... Because you're not remembering just the good stuff. You're having to remember all the frustration right. and, and horrible comments right. <laughs> <laughs> well, that and, happened right and One of the challenges for a race or anybody sort of of that ilk is that you know, that that, uh, that practice session that race isn't the date's not going to change your book can come out whenever and sometimes people work better when they've got that back against the wall i have to get this done i have to figure this out and your autobiography is kind of on you um I, it, true and really i i sort of think of that book as my actual legacy it got right. great reviews right. but it didn't make any bestseller lists unfortunately okay. <laughs> and again just put this on the podcast you're doing this out of the kindness of your heart to be with us. So to reward you, go to JanetGuthrie.com, Amazon.com, buy the book. It helps everybody. Hanging with my drinking buddy, Janet Guthrie. Yeah, so uh, we, just, we just paused for lunch, and, um, and, and you declared that it is completely okay to refer to Ryan as your drinking buddy. Yes, Ryan yes. is now my drinking buddy. That's going on that's, the yeah. that, That's on the resume now. Twitter profile. That's in the, it. everything. Yeah, everything. That's, that's <laughs> it. We drink the same thing. Exactly. <laughs> now, yeah, last I checked, you're not on Twitter or Facebook or anything. I do have a public site and a private site on p Facebook, okay. um, and I'm on LinkedIn. Okay. But 
Frankly, I, I never post anything. I, I, I have not gotten acquainted sure. with the internet age to sure. that extent. So kind of cutting back to where we, where we lost off. So, you know, you, you run at Trenton, there's a whole lot of hullabaloo in your words, but most <laughs> of it negative. Well, it sounds like the press went crazy because of what was happening, but then the drivers went crazy because they didn't want to have to race against a woman. Right. Because they were afraid for their safety. All right, so they said. Right, well, That's, that was what I was going to say. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. L let me back up and correct that just a little. Most of the really dreadful negative stuff was between the time that uh, my team owner, Rolla Volstead, uh, uh, announced our intentions yeah. in Indianapolis in March and the time I drove my first IndyCar race at Trenton at the beginning of May. Sure. That race calmed down things quite a bit. Because you, you, you stuck to the plan. You, you drove steady. You didn't do anything crazy. I was, yeah. a, I was a courteous driver, and I gave them some good competition. Okay, right. And that's what it was all about, sure, after of course, all. Of course. Um, and so after Trenton, um, the worst of the negative stuff calmed down. Okay. What was the worst thing said to you? Well, nobody ever said anything to me directly. I always oh, that's had even worse, actually. Yeah, right. Okay. That's way worse. Yeah, that's uh, I'm not going to tag this person in this post, Yeah. but I'm angry about something. Yeah, and then when you talk to them in person, they generally just kind of stand there and don't say anything. Right. So that's still right. the same. So what was the worst <laughs> quote you read? Oh, let me see. Oh, it's in my book. I... I, I um, there was a we'll bleep the name so that they have to buy the book to find out <laughs> who it is. Ooh, I like that. Uh -huh. yeah, we'll yeah. drive sales. Yeah, we're going to do it. Um, well, of course, there were all the drivers being quoted as saying she's going to kill us, that kind of thing. Sure. Yeah. Um, but, uh, and this was before, I must emphasize again, this was, was before, before my first IndyCar right. race at Trenton. Um, but before my first... Indianapolis race, there was a columnist, a nationally syndicated columnist, if I remember correctly, his name was um, who said, uh, well, Indianapolis is now going to adopt a suggestion I made a long time ago um, uh, that they should have Women drivers, drunk drivers. <laughs> like they're the same thing. Yeah, right. right. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, wow. And then there was one <laughs> in the Boston Globe that said something like, I can see Ms. Guthrie on the starting line fishing through her handbag looking for her lipstick. Oh. Yeah. I mean, right. I, it, was, it, it's, it was really astonishing yeah. to me. I yeah. had never experienced anything like right. that. Well, and then on top of that, if they knew anything about you, you're the one that's building engines in the back of a station wagon. Yeah. You yeah. know, you're not the With girly girl that's... Bachelors in physics. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, right, you right. know? You tried out to be an astronaut. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> wow, okay. So fortunately, once I had driven a few IndyCar races, that all got calmed down. Sure. And <coughs> similarly in NASCAR. Yeah. Um, in fact, in, in IndyCar, is the situation got calmed down by the end of the first year, which I think I drove maybe four IndyCar races that first year. I'd have to look to be sure. Yeah. Right. And in NASCAR, it took a little longer. It took sure. until the middle of 77. Uh, <laughs> okay, I was going to say, was there anybody in IndyCar to start with that wouldn't let it go? Like, was there somebody that, like, even after you'd proven the merit and been yeah. there, had been fast, they're like, nope, not going to, can't have it. Yes, there was. I would just as soon not name that person. Uh, but on the other hand, there was Johnny Rutherford. Okay. Okay. He's not called Gentleman Johnny for nothing. Sure. Okay. Um, in that very first year, '76, I was out on the track in practice in Rollo's car, the one that I didn't make the field in, um, um, and. I came out of turn two, and 
Johnny pulled to the inside of the track and slowed down. And then he pulled in behind me and followed me through a couple of turns. And then we had a yellow flag and I pitted and I said to Rolla, Johnny Rutherford just went way out of his way to follow me through a couple of turns. I want to go down to his pit and see what he saw. And then here comes Johnny Rutherford. He's coming to meet you. He's, nice. com he's yeah. coming to talk to Rolla. Uh, okay. He says, well, I don't see anything wrong with their driving, but you need to stand the right rear up a huh. bit. It's tucking under in the turns. Now, can oh, you imagine? Okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's Johnny Rutherford. Yeah. Yeah. Now you see that, and you go, I can't believe they're running that wing angle. I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> yeah, <honestly>. exactly. <laughs> you know? I but the away. fact that he would come and, and say that, that's pretty JR's cool. JR's got game. Yeah. All right. Yeah. yeah. Rutherford's on it. He's on it. Yeah. Okay. He is a super, super <laughs> guy. There's, and, and there's a, the story goes, and I don't know if it's in your book or not, but uh, uh, that that to prove that you had pace that A.J. Foyt let you run four laps in one of his cars. Oh, that's that's perfectly true. It, it, it takes a while in the telling, unfortunately. But <clears throat> it became clear by the last weekend of qualifying that Rala of Alstead's blue car, the one that... Is Tom Bigelow had not been able to put in the field the previous year, yeah. was not going to come up to speed. Okay. At least not in my hands and in my opinion, not in anyone's sure, hands. Sure, yeah, yeah. Um, and um, Rolla made a move, I think, unprecedented for a, uh, for a team owner because... <laughs> uh, there was a saying then that when nothing else works you change the nut behind the wheel yeah yeah sure <laughs> um rala went out looking for another ride for me in a car that would not belong to rala volstead wow and he yeah that wouldn't happen today yeah wow okay. it, i don't think it's ever happened sure. rala is right. one of a kind so rala went to leo mel who was the great good guy of Goodyear at the time and said, can you find someone who will let Janet make a qualifying attempt in her car? And Leo and I talk about this every time we see each other at the old timers in <laughs> Indianapolis <laughs> every year. Um, among the, dr the team owners that, that Leo Mel approached was uh, A.J. Foyt. And so on the eve of the last day of qualifying at Indianapolis in 1976, A.J. Foyt said that I could take his backup car out. And I went to his garage and got fitted to it. Um, his legs were a lot shorter than mine. My uh, The uh, foot pedal assembly had to be moved forward, all that kind of thing. Um, and the next day I took it out in practice and in something like six laps I was almost 10 miles an hour faster than I had ever gone in Rollo's car. Oh wow, okay. And I was fast enough to make the field. And then we had a yellow. Jim Hurtabees had spun out and somebody yelled, it's Herc. And what A.J. Foyt thought he heard was, it's her. Yeah. And he said, oh, my God, did she spin? Did she hurt the car? <laughs> <laughs> but it was Jim Hurtabee's. Right, sure. And so there was a yellow light while uh, this was cleaned up. And um, I went out for, I think, two more laps, if I remember right. And then the yellow came and that was it until qualifying started and i went back to rala's garage and sat there trying to preserve the mindset that had enabled me who sure. was sleeping in the back of my 75 dollar tow car right. the previous <laughs> year <laughs> had enabled me to take a j foyt's car out onto Indianapolis right. and run it fast enough to make the field. Anyway, um, about an hour before the end of qualifying, AJ came out of his garage and announced that he wasn't going to let me make a qualifying attempt in it. 
So I had to wait until the next year. Right. Um, but that ride, that drive, brief as it was, also turned a lot of people's yeah. minds around. Yeah, so even though I didn't get a chance to qualify for its car, and I would have put it into the right. field, right. Um, I, I, I'm very grateful to him for sure. changing a lot of people's minds. What was the reason that he didn't? Qualify. Well, I knew that his crew didn't want him to let me drive his car. They told me so when was they were the female thing, or they just it. didn't want another car out there that they had to deal with? I that's hard to say. Okay. Because AJ often did let um, another driver. I'm not coming up with his name at the moment. I'm sorry. Another driver often drove AJ's backup car. Takuma in, Sato. In in the races. Oh, George George Snyder. Oh, okay. oh yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, so I, I'll never know what went through AJ's sure, mind. Sure, sure. Um, We're never going to get him, so we'll never be able to find <laughs> him. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, his, his memory of what happened may be different at this point. Sure. So anyway... Um, so I had to wait. I, I saw him in the restaurant of the uh, sp uh, Speedway Inn the next morning, and I went over to his table and thanked him. And yeah. he was a bit distant, uh, mm. so I let it go at that and went on. But what was happening was that <coughs> there had been this offer to drive in the 600-mile race uh, at Charlotte, the NASCAR Cup race at Charlotte, the same day as the Indy yep. 500. That offer had been floating around, and I didn't want to know about it. I didn't want to deal with it, not until my Indianapolis sure, was over. Was over right. But Rolla Volstead, bless his heart, had kept his finger on the pulse of it all along. So that morning, we sat down at breakfast with representatives from Charlotte Motor Speedway and the woman who had bought the car that I was to drive, Linda Ferrari. And um, Rala asked me, well, do you want to stay here or do you want to go to Charlotte and try something completely different? And you'd never <laughs> driven a stock car at this point? I'd never even seen a stock car <laughs> race. <laughs> I mean, I couldn't imagine now, you know, like you've never driven a stock car on an oval, correct? Or uh, yeah, I have. Oh, okay. Yeah. But, but like going into Sprint Cup and all of a sudden. Well, yeah. I mean, uh, it, it was very, very different than yeah. what I expected it to be. Okay. But I had driven heavy tin tops that whole way up to that. Yeah. Whereas if you're racing sports cars, then you go to and indie, indie cars, cars. Yeah, exactly. And then now go back to a car with no aero. Yeah. You know, it's and also it's 3,500 pounds. pounds. So, exactly. Yeah. No power steering either. It's yeah, not sure, power yeah. steering back then. And no, no method of cooling. Boy, those cars were yeah, hot. I believe it. Uh, yeah. Cale Yarborough had a, uh, a, a system that ran ice water through a cap underneath yeah. his helmet. Huh. Okay. And it failed in that Charlotte race. And Cale was in big trouble. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, but anyway, so um, the next morning after my, I must tell you, heartbreaking failure to make the field at Indianapolis. Sure. Yes. Well, especially you had so much exposure on you and, oh, can she do it and all that. And then, of course, you don't make the field through I, no fault of yours. I'd argue so. now you know it's not it's not, not taking anything away from your previous car owner, but you right. know you have the talent to get in the field if the equipment's right. That, to me, would be the biggest thing. Yeah. It's like, I could have been there. Right. You know? The next day, I'm on my way to Charlotte to drive in the famous Charlotte 600 mile yeah. race at that time called the World 600. Yeah. The car wasn't ready. Uh, that's a whole nother story that I won't go into, but I did make the field. I qualified on the row behind Dale Earnhardt Sr. and Bill Elliott. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Their cars failed, so technically I beat them, them, but in yes. point Smoked of fact. Yeah, let us say, <laughs> you're a real race driver. You're going to invent everything here. <laughs> Let's. Anyway. And I finished, oh, I think 15th, if I remember right. And so that was the beginning of the NASCAR adventure. Right. And, you know, NASCAR uh, 
not that either of us were around during that time, but arguably it was at that time a much more southern sport, more of a boys club. That's did you the good old boys? Yeah. Did days. you discover a different in sort of boys environment in NASCAR versus IndyCar at that time? Um, IndyCars were more sophisticated cars. Sure. Um, NASCAR was nothing trivial at that time. Sure. Um, they raced all across the country. Right. Um, but in terms of sort of the acceptance or the culture that you were putting yourself into, uh, you know, the, the sort of NASCAR boys club that we always hear about, was that worse, better, different than IndyCar? Oh, again, there are a couple of stories in my book that are sort of funny. That but you can buy <laughs> at JanetGuthrie.com. That's right. So or on Amazon. On Amazon. Uh, a Life at Full Throttle. A Life at Full Throttle, that's right. Written by me, not by a ghost. <laughs> <laughs> Um, in any case, yeah, there were shouts coming over from gr the grandstands. Oh, Get the yeah. tits out of the pits. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because women were loud in the pits. <laughs> so, wow. Right. Yeah. Yeah. God, that's amazing. Wow. Like, just think about it. Yeah. It wasn't that long ago. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah so yeah. crazy. Yeah. Uh, that's crazy. They, uh, the rumors were going around that the only way I could possibly make the yep. field at Charlotte was if the officials falsified my times. Uh, right. uh, so yeah. when yeah. I made my qualifying run, there were all these stopwatches and all these hands. Oh, <laughs> <geez>. <laughs> sure. okay, yeah. But in fact, it was legitimate. Um, and, um, and so I ran the race. Uh, had a carbon monoxide leak, one thing or another. Um, finished legitimately ahead of Buddy Baker's father, okay. who had been a great hero of NASCAR yeah, in his yeah. early days. Right. And Buck Baker had yeah. said, I'd never yeah. make the field. And then you beat, and him. You beat him. And yeah. then I legitimately beat him. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it was it was interesting. Now, would you ever kind of turn your chin up to those guys after races like that and be like, told you, or would you just let it go? I'd let it go. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you're better than me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, looking at your NASCAR records, like there's a lot of top 10, top 15 finishes. Oh, yeah. And these are against the legends this of the sport. Kale like Yarborough, every Richard name Bay, and, yeah. that you read on your website's JanetGuthrie.com. Yeah. Uh, results, it's like Ricky Rudd, Bobby Allison, Buddy Baker, you know, Neil Bonnet, the, the stars of the sport. Richard like, Petty, uh, Kale yeah. Yarbrough. Well, now you're just bragging. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but, like, that had to make you a legitimate star of that sport at the time. Well, I, 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 I wasn't, I wasn't a, a, a star. I mean, I only really had uh, about two-thirds of one full season okay. in NASCAR Cup racing and um, a grand total of 33 races spread over five years. Yeah. But still, um, I had top 10 qualifying positions, top 10 finishes, um, my best finish was sixth, uh, which in only 33 cup races um, wasn't too bad. And that was at Bristol, right? It was at Bristol. Which is a crazy place. And like, I mean, literally, the number of top tens you had as a female driver, that record was only broken like a year ago or two years ago by Danica. Uh, I, and let's see, there's one record I'm still tied with, and I can't that's remember a, whether it's top NASCAR finish or that's, that's quantity of yeah. top tens. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's the highest finish. You guys are tied. Uh, okay. yeah. But at this point, she's driven about... Yeah, a lot more races <laughs> than you have, <laughs> Ten right. more times and races than I ever did. Sure, and, sure. and let's just take the obvious road here that the equipment you were in wasn't built by the best team at the time. You weren't in equal equipment to Richard Petty. Yeah, to or the, the guy that won the championship. You know. Know. No. Buddy yeah. Baker told me once that our engines were about 50 horsepower down from the um, top running teams. Right, yeah. And he was in a position to know. He would say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Interesting. See? And yeah, nice. strong results. What's a, Talk about the difference 
well, maybe not the difference, but just describe what a 1960s Indy car was like to drive. Uh, 70s. Sorry, 1970s. 1970s. Well, I had only driven a rear-engine car once in my life, and that was a Formula V at <laughs> Sebring. <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> <laughs> so it did take a, a bit of getting used to. And um, Dick Simon, Ralph Volstead's number one driver, was very good at car setups. And he did most of the setting up because Ralla didn't have the money for a chief mechanic for me. Um, and so it took me quite a while to figure out what kind of sensation for the driver meant what needed fixing on the car. That was, that was very difficult. Um, that was probably the hardest thing to do. In 1978, the second time I made the field for Indianapolis, when I ran my own team on a budget about 5% of the budget of the top running team at the time, um, and um, was trying to figure out what the car was doing. I finally figured out that the unsettling little lift that it did going into turns one and three meant that the uh, shock absorber rebound wasn't stiff enough. Okay, sure. And that was like, oh, I'm starting to figure out what these cars do, <laughs> right. uh, which, was, which was a very good feeling. Right. Well, beyond the budget, I mean, part of that was the fact that you just didn't get to drive these cars. You weren't doing a full season yeah. of IndyCar racing the way everybody else was, so you couldn't get the seat time to figure out all the mechanical elements of it. Yeah, I only ever drove 11 IndyCar races. Wow. Um, three Indy 500s with the right. best finish there of ninth, uh, and that was the year I ran my own team on right. a low budget. Um, a lo <laughs> bought the car, bought the engines for the car, hired the crew, rented the apartments for the crew, rented right. the curtains for the apartments for the crew. <laughs> <laughs> no one, like, I don't know yeah. what that means. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's not a thing. That's such but, but and that's what's interesting to me. So, uh, uh, you know, you quit basically because you were tired of having to do this sponsorship hunt and try and find a way to pay for all this, correct? It wasn't that I was tired of it. It was that I had finally realized it was hopeless. Okay. And I was going to kill myself if I kept trying. This was at 37? That, that, was, that was in um, 1983. Right. That I finally quit trying to find the money to keep right. racing at the top levels. Okay. And um, I, s I will never cease regretting that I wasn't able to continue. Right. Uh, because certainly in NASCAR Cup racing, right. I had good reason to believe that I was going to win a race yeah. in less than the usual five years at that time. Right. And what can I tell you? I'll always regret it. Sure, sure. But, but that's interesting. I mean, in 2016, we hear yeah, it's one of those, much like drivers trying to find the funding or whatever it is, it's a story that I don't care if it's the 1930s or 2016, finding the funding, finding the sponsorship is always the, the, the Achilles heel of, of the sport. Um, what was, you know, you were making national news at the time. What was the biggest kind of roadblock for you to finding sponsorship? Was it, was it, reputation namesake was it just not having a network and a rolodex of every major fortune 500 out there well one doesn't know i mean um all those sponsors i pitched and i pitched oh my sure. lord hundreds <laughs> and of you them. didn't have powerpoint and i didn't yeah. have PowerPoint. so you had to make them all like you didn't just swap out a name and give them a new thing you had to make a whole new deck every I time pitched guys i was sitting next to on airplanes uh, <laughs> oh sure been there the head of Lowe's, who eventually became a major yeah, what are they stock doing car now? sponsor, right. <laughs> uh, uh, didn't didn't make any any progress. Well, what they would usually say is, well, you know, we can we can see what you've done in such a short time, and but our 
budget just doesn't allow it. Right. That was all they would ever say. And That's interesting. Who okay. knows what their reasoning was. And it were these people that had had a history of being in, in the sport? Uh, some of them. Okay. Yeah, um, my own opinion is that <laughs> a lot of these heads of corporations, I enjoy being associated with the macho of sports car, of, of IndyCar racing and cup racing. And a woman driver doesn't do a lot right. for <laughs> a, a corporation president's right. matcha. Well, this is because there's when we were kind of doing our research, we, we discovered a few uh, Texaco Haviland commercials on YouTube. Um, but to that point, like the things you were doing are not what you would normally see in a car commercial. They you weren't doing burnouts and talking about this is the best performing tire. It was like here's how you save gas, and it's your foot on an eggshell, and <laughs> and it's about car care and maintenance. Like it, they weren't the macho things that you would normally see in a race car driver doing right. a commercial. Yeah. Well, uh, that never occurred to me actually. <laughs> okay, <laughs> <laughs> I solved. I'm a marketing guy. Uh. I solved it. <laughs> but in any event, I I'm very glad that I got the opportunity to drive cars at the top levels in the United States. Um, I was hoping for Le Mans and the Targa Florio because yeah. I was a sports car driver. Sure. And so unexpectedly I, I got the chance at Indianapolis and the Daytona 500 and um, it's a huge part of my life. I cherish the quaint notion that it's what I was born to do. Sure. I and what can I tell you? Yeah. So earlier you mentioned uh, your book, which is Janet Guthrie, A Life at Full Throttle. Yes. And uh, some of our listeners and some of our other guests are aware of the uh, the memoir Johnny O'Connell's working on about the time he ran over Dario Franchitti in Detroit. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with that story. Oh, of course. Yeah. Everyone knows that. Yeah, exactly. So. When you wrote the book and you put it out there, for the reason I ask is because when we put out our podcast last year, because I'm trying to make this about us, um, that when we put it out, we honestly had no idea what the response would be. And then when we got to hear from not only fans, but also other people in the sport that they really enjoyed it, that was one of the most rewarding things I've done in my career, and I'm sure Sean feels the same way. It's Did the anybody only reach thing out? I've done to in my career. This is all you've got. Yeah, it's all yeah. I've got, man. Yeah, the Ryan Eversley podcast. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, did anybody reach out? Any of your peers that had read it that you said, "Wow, thanks for taking the time," and and I appreciate that. I still get letters about the book from people who have just read it. In fact, I just discovered two days ago that someone, this July, just two three months ago posted a long review on Goodreads, the okay. big internet oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. book site. Uh, a really long review praising the book. Back when it was published, Sports Illustrated called it um, the best book ever written about the sport of racing. Huh. Oh, so okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, this took you like, what, three, four years to do, you said. It took me 23 years from beginning Excuse to me. publication. More than, more than, what you said. <laughs> more than three or four. <laughs> <laughs> well, real life interfered. Sure. Um, the things that happen in real life. My late husband's daughter had to have a bone marrow transplant oh, removed to worst. Seattle for a year. Uh, Hurricane Andrew hit my parents' house in Miami and made. Ah, <sighs> made a real mess of the place. Um, that kind of thing. Sure. Real life. Yeah, real <laughs> life. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of cutting to today a little bit, uh, you know, the, you know, and it, it, what's funny about the stories you're telling me is, to me, the scene actually hasn't changed that much. People are still looking for rides. Yeah. There's still people not getting the chances they should have gotten. Um, but uh, uh, do you... Do you I mean, I hate, I hate to ask the obvious question, but somebody like, you know, Danica, who, who you know, has kind of opened up a whole new door of exposure and sponsorship and whatnot, uh, does the side of you see that and get irritated? Are you happy to see that? Do you not care? Well, Danica's a, a good middle-of-the-field driver. Um, I do have a problem with how she got where she was. I mean, all you have to do is look up Danica and Google Images, uh, and it's, it's rather horrifying. 
Um, the woman I really wish had gotten a better chance is Sarah Fisher. Yeah, who yeah. Was well, tremendously you're, you're not going to get any talented. arguments from us. Yeah. We, Gosh darn right. We had, like we were saying before, we never met her, and and a mutual friend was like, yeah, she'd be into it, and we were so blown away by how cool she was, yeah, and level-headed, and and just like the, the way yeah. she thinks about the sport, like most people that are successful. So, so I 100% agree. So you with talk about the like with Danica the the willingness to do the modeling and some of the the photos that are out there. So <laughs> that, like oh wow, the face says it all. So that's a no. Uh, um, the uh, did those calls ever come to you? Like, did Hugh Hefner call you? Uh, oh, any offers like that? Somebody asked me a question along those lines yeah. one time, and I said, no way, no how, under right. no circumstances, sure. never. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, even though it was what I most wanted in life, I wasn't willing to do that kind of sure. thing for sure. it. Sure. Because but that's so the classic view of women. Right. Uh, the only thing they have to sell is their bodies. Sexuality, sure. Yeah. And yeah. I, I wasn't into that. Right. Yeah. So did you actually turn anything down? Yes. Oh, great. Okay. Mm. Silence. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, who? So earlier we mentioned yeah. a name, and, and you were very quick to dismiss said name. Is there a Robin Miller, Janet Guthrie rivalry we don't know about? No, uh, no. Uh, Robin uh, Miller was always extremely hostile toward me oh. and, in fact, printed untruths oh. in the Indianapolis Star. Gotcha. And um, uh, if I were a really good Christian, I would attempt uh, to forgive him. I guess I'm not that good a Christian. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. <laughs> yeah, hey, got your standards. That's uh, not to beat, beat on the current women thing, but who, uh, of the, sort of the modern era of female drivers, who, Sarah is obviously one of them. Is there anybody else that's sort of in your Oh, I am wheelhouse? so sorry that Sarah never really got the right ride. She was so good. Yeah. Um, she was the one who broke most of my old IndyCar records uh, that I set before she was born. <laughs> 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 um, but I, I, and she's such a great person. Yeah. She's she's yeah. really wonderful. I admire Sarah Fisher a great deal. And uh, next to wishing that I had been able to continue at the top, I wish Sarah had been able to continue at the top. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of good drivers, good women drivers out there. It's just a question of which good woman driver gets the chance. Sure, sure. Catherine Legg is very good. Simona Di Silvestro is very good. Um, uh, Pippa Mann is is very good. Uh, none of them have ever had top rides. Sure. And so the women are there. It just depends on who finds the money and who gets the chance. Right, right. Well, then taking the woman side of this out of it, who is who is your favorite driver that you got to race against? Like maybe not necessarily for their on track. But they're off-track personalities. Obviously, you mentioned Rutherford was quite the gentleman. Like, I, I imagine being around a Mario Andretti back in the day, like in his heyday, or, or people like that. That everything's going for him. They had to be a complete riot off the track. Um, Mario paid me a compliment at the time. You will find it on my website. Um, JanetGuthrie.com. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, Johnny is definitely my favorite. He's yeah. so talented. There's a smile on your face every time you mention so, him. So uh, he has made so many contributions to the sport yeah. outside of his driving. Um, let's see, Danny Gaius, who isn't really a famous name nowadays, but he He's was a tremendous a driver. Flying Hawaiian. Uh, yes, That's right. exactly. Danny on the gas. My dad was a big fan of his. Um, I was driving a um, single turbo Porsche at Watkins Glen, which I'd never driven before, and I hadn't driven on a road circuit in something like five years. Sure. And uh, Danny gave me a tip about how to handle a single turbo Porsche. Yeah. Um, that kind of thing did happen. In NASCAR, it was sort of interesting. There were guys that gave me some help, but it turned out that if I credited them to a mm -hmm. reporter and it was in the papers the next day, 
they didn't want to come yeah, near yeah, me. Yeah, hey, don't, don't, <laughs> don't, right, yeah. Uh, Donnie Allison was an exception. Donnie Allison gave me some very valuable help at the first NASCAR Cup race I sure. drove at Charlotte. Uh, a really good guy. Yeah. Uh, it's it's secure guys like that that weren't afraid to give me a right. hand. Right, they knew their place. They were happy where they were. Yeah. Now, female drivers today get quite the creepy fan follow. Yeah. <laughs> As does Sean, surprisingly. <laughs> um, was that a thing back then? Would you get guys that would follow you from racetrack to racetrack with the T-shirt and the sign? And uh, not, uh, not really, although about six guys showed up at Pocono one time all wearing T-shirts that read, I'm a Janet Guthrie groupie. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> right. I thought that was pretty funny. Right. <laughs> But there was never that one guy who's like at this track, like, hey, Janet, and then he's all of a sudden, he's at Pocono two weeks later. No. There was no, never that guy. Okay. No, okay. I, didn't get, I didn't get followed. What like about that. The, uh, the BS sponsor? Because everybody in modern racing has that story of that person that led them down a road for months, meeting after meeting, and it turned out they never had the sponsor oh, yeah. that they that's talked about they had. That's a good question. Like, I'd imagine you were in a prime position for that, that con man. That was what I was afraid of yeah. when I first talked with Rolla Falstead because, sure. as, I, yeah. as I say, some women drivers had gotten egg on their faces that way, yeah. Yeah. and I really wanted to make sure he was real yeah. uh, before I agreed to do something with him, and Rolla Falstead was definitely real. Right. He was... He was probably the best team owner I could have driven for. Sure. He didn't have much money, right. but he got where he was on knowledge and passion for the sport, and uh, we were really suited to each other. A, a really good guy. It's really, I, I don't know if this happens for you because you're on the other side of it, but for me, I've had several people in my career that have really made the difference to help me get Along the way, no, I feel out of the way to not help me. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really interesting phenomenon. So you have like a hatred where I have like I, a, yeah. a mutual admiration for but somebody. But that that's because you're also likable. That's <laughs> like probably the biggest difference. <laughs> but anyways, I can appreciate your relationship with him because I have several people that took that chance on me and, and thought that I was worthy of an opportunity, and I, I get the sense that you have that's like a mutual admiration because you could tell they cared about what you were trying to do, and then he and you cared about them, you know, for the opportunity, it just continues into a long friendship. Because a lot of this stuff, and now this I do know that you know, Sean, is that it's friendships that are built around the mutual interest of racing, you know, or, or sport in general, you know. So one of the questions I had for you, since you did stop racing, 85, 86-ish? Um, well, my last major race was the Daytona 500 of 1980, yeah. and in the middle 80s, I drove for the Peugeot factory right, team in right. endurance races. What filled the void after racing? What gave you the... Okay. Nothing. Nothing? Hmm. Really? Hmm. No, I never, I never found anything. Chardonnay. Yeah. <laughs> Chardonnay got you. you know. <laughs> but to, that, to exactly that point, like, so you're going to, you know, it's, it's almost 2.30, um, we're going to wrap this up. You're going to thank God it's all over. <laughs> and, uh, no, and, this has and been fun. All right. You can go on a road trip with us. To, you want to <laughs> come with us? We, we got room for we more. Got, we, got a, we got a van, <laughs> Honda Odyssey. Um, we're going to we set up a meeting between you and Robin Miller. Yep. And we're going to tie him down. Up. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but like what, so what, like what are you going to do today? Oh, let's see. Um, to be honest? Yeah. Being a naturally reclusive person, I'm going to go home and do something completely mindless. Okay. <laughs> um, I love I everything about yeah. this. Uh, You're going to run a marketing company. <laughs> 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 no, I don't think that's mindless. <laughs> no. Nah. She's so it's nice it's to you. Pretty, yeah. I don't, you're, if you knew me, you would not be this nice, trust me. Uh. <laughs> um, I've got... An interview with the New York Times tomorrow. So and she <laughs> wanted to do it today, and I said... But you said you had bigger fish to fry, right? <laughs> no, no, oh. no. Oh, oh. I said I've got a firm appointment <laughs> on okay. Thursday, oh. uh, and I don't think I can handle two interviews like yeah. this in and one we're day. And we're just say, please, come on, just tell us we're a bigger deal than the New York Times. Hey, I, I, you guys have done 
I mean, I admire you so much for the questions that you have All thought right. up to ask. That is the hard part. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <We've been laughs> no, it really is. That's the beauty of the road trip is we can plan it out. We have a, we had a day and a half to figure this out. But we've been in, in these interviews. Yeah. I don't even know if we should call them interviews because we're just, yeah, like they're just hanging out <laughs> conversations. Yeah. But we've been in them where it's like, I'm, I'm good. You got anything? Yeah. Like, I don't know what to ask. Uh, yeah. Um, we but we'll call that Derek Walker. <laughs> Are you familiar with Derek Walker? Okay, so he's a, a longtime IndyCar team owner, and uh, now he ran it just like SCCA or something. Yeah, I don't know what he's doing. About I know who he is, okay, but yeah, I don't know so, him. So he's sat, actually a really good guy. Yeah, he was cool. But we sat down with him last year, and about an hour before we got to his shop, we're sending like a, hey, just letting you know we'll be there in about an hour, and we'll be bringing food and, and the audio equipment. And, and he replies like, sounds good. Audio equipment not necessary. And, uh, no, no, we no, need it. We, we need to bring it. Like it's part of the thing. Yeah, but, you know, he's but he's not from an era where podcasts were a thing, yeah. and so he had but no the, idea what we were doing. But the thing but about Derek that I that I found hilarious because I don't know if he was doing it on purpose or not, but he wouldn't necessarily lead us down the conversation. You know, like, oh, that's a great question. That reminds me of this story when this happened. He would just say, "Yeah." I'd be like, uh, okay, what was Penske like? <laughs> He's like, oh, all right, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I really admire the preparation you guys oh, you. did and the uh, the questions we you thought of. We put a solid 20 minutes into this. It's the this. first time we've ever had the New York Times push aside for us. Yeah, so we're <laughs> going to have not the last. That's going to go on the website. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's, and just, it's just a little thing. Apparently, Simon and Schuster is it's publishing just a, three a page book centerpiece. That, that has me in it. And, oh, and this yeah. reporter wants to talk to me about it in connection with the book. Sure. Yeah. I didn't even know uh, the book was coming out. So, now, so uh, especially within motorsports, since you're, you're such a historic name, how good are you about remembering people? So, like, if Ryan and I see you in, like, a year, will you – and you can say no, you it's won't okay know. To like, not it's know. totally okay to not know. Like, we, we – because we do this with Derek Walker every time we see him because he doesn't remember us to save his life. Every time. Every time. We're like, hey, Derek. And he'd be like, hi. Hi. Like, so if we see – like, if I go to the Indy 500 in a couple of years and you make an appearance and I say, hey, Janet, are you going to not know who I am? It's okay to say, yeah, I'm not going to have a clue. It's totally fine. Look, I'm 78. <laughs> for Christ's sake. <laughs> so, what's your what's your uh, what's your default? I don't know. I'm gonna, but I'm gonna pretend like I know. Him. Like the uh, answer is, oh. if you say we're the guys that talked to you in the hotel Jerome yeah. in yeah. October yeah. of last year, right. of course I'll know All who right. you are. Right. Yeah. But from your faces, no. Okay. I probably what's, would not. What's your default? Pretend like you know them, but you don't. Good like, to see like you. Good to see you. You know what I mean? Like, what's what's the? How do I know you're faking it? <laughs> Great to see you again. <laughs> <laughs> like twenty After people. After you've reminded me. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. Once you've reminded me of the circumstances, I will absolutely good. not forget it. Okay. Okay. So, so wrapping up, we have a pass along question that we do for every guest, and. Our last guest was Joey Hand, who's an American factory Ford driver. He just won Le Mans this year in the GTLM class and, like, the big, big class er, for GT cars. And he's raced for BMW as a factory driver. He was an open-wheel guy for a long time, wanted to go to Indy, didn't really get the brakes, ended up having an amazing sports car career, and he's only 36 30, years old. Yeah, he's got so. a long way to go. Um, his question for you was snowboarding or skiing? Um. Yeah. I have quit both Okay. because too many of my friends have gotten hit by snowboarders and okay. spent a year in a neck brace or doing yeah, yeah. ACL okay. therapy. Okay. So, uh, but I never snowboarded. Okay. Fair enough. So you're a skier, not snowboarder. Okay. I'm a skier. Our next was a skier. Was a skier. Mm -hmm. Our next guest, Brad Kettler. He's a longtime mechanic and engineer in the sports car world. If you've seen the Le Mans documentaries with Audi over the last couple of years where they had this truth in 24, don't no. worry about it. He, he was one of the instrumental people in those, those cars doing well at Le Mans, yeah. basically. But he's an American guy. He actually worked for my dad. My dad had a shop a long time ago. Um, any question you could think to ask Brad Kettler, and it doesn't have to be racing-related or serious. Yeah. He's been like the American Audi guy Rep. for a decade for the last 15 yeah. years or so yeah. so why do you enjoy actually working on cars <laughs> <laughs> i like that a lot perfect because <laughs> it's true <laughs> <laughs> how's right. colorado changed by the way 
I'm sure. How has Colorado oh, changed, yeah. by the way? Yeah, because Sean had this plan to take you to a dispensary. Yeah, it was like, we, we go to a dispensary with Janet Gathery. <laughs> <laughs> Are you down? You in? I keep thinking of going to one. Uh, uh, um, this is your seeing day. what it's all about. Well, let's go. <laughs> we had the same conversation. Yeah, we're like, we're we like, just need to go to one. Because, like, I don't, I don't do any of that Partake. stuff, but it's like, Janet Guthrie said, hey, let's go. I'm like, all right, I'll do that. So. <laughs> I don't even know where they are. <laughs> all right. All right. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, we don't walk in. They're like, hey, Janet, good to see you. The usual. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. So uh, one thing that I've wondered about you, since you're clearly an engineer by passion, is there anything you see out there in the world, not necessarily motorsports, that currently – you're attracted to like a SpaceX program or the Tesla car or gadgets like iPhones or is there anything that you're into in that in that sense? No, the world of information technology is is difficult for me, um, and um, I, I I wish I had a better grip on it and could use Facebook and knew what to do with Twitter, which I certainly don't. Um, it, it's it's as big a difference as it was for my grandfather, who was a young man when the Wright brothers first flew, and he lived to see man walks on moon. Uh, but the, the, the revolution in information technology, I mean, yeah, I can get on my computer and book airline tickets and, and do all that kind of stuff, but... Um, there is a huge amount that I don't know about IT that I wish I did. I'll give you credit. You're really good with your email. Like you respond within a day. Can't say the same for everybody. Yeah, can't say the same for PR people in the sport. So, uh, <laughs> so that's. I'll give you credit. Um, I got nothing. <laughs> I think good. I think it's yeah. solid. Yeah. So, anything you anything you were afraid of walking in here? I mean, I know we're intimidating guys between our stature and fame. <laughs> Poor posture. Poor posture. <laughs> Gut. Well, truthfully, I am by nature a, a reclusive person. Sure. Right. So there was a, a little stress getting ready sure. for this, but you guys have made it so easy oh, and so enjoyable. All right. Boom. Uh, That's all you, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> but are you familiar with Bob Varsha? We've met. I don't really know him. Okay, so we same kind of thing. We we know who he is. Obviously, he's called our races and things like that. But he sat. He was one of our first people we sat down with. Yeah. And he couldn't have been Cooler. better going about the whole thing. Yeah. But at the end of it, he he said that it was an enlightening. Was that his word? Enlightening. Enlightening, yeah. enlightening thing because he got to think back to all the things that helped. And then he paid us a compliment later off there that he said, um, and I'm just bragging now. Yeah. <laughs> but he said the environment that you're setting makes it easy to discuss things like this and i thought that's what we were hoping that's for. a compliment yeah. so thank you for saying that it does actually really help us yeah it, it's it's really been enjoyable great thank you. that's thank it you. so on that same regard we can wrap up yeah yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah so so i'd say continental's got the check meow, meow. Wow, that was such a great episode. That guest really knew how to tell a story. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed that Janet Guthrie episode, Ryan. And, you know, thank you for sticking with me through the month-long process that is editing these. You're welcome, Sean. I'm right here. All right, once again, huge, huge thank you to Janet Guthrie, who gave us her time, really doesn't owe us anything, and, and couldn't have been more cool about the whole process. So please, please, please go to JanetGuthrie.com. Check out her book. I think it's also available uh, on uh, Amazon resellers and whatnot. But uh, Janet benefits the most if you go directly to her website and uh, purchase it there. So in the spirit of awesome women that I know, uh, I'm going to once again turn it over to uh, the Blue Hours Band, uh, who is a band we introduced you to during uh, season one. But uh, Teresa Calfatura, who's a, a good friend of mine that I grew up with in uh, Northern California, has been going strong with this band. they got a few gigs coming up, uh, but they have an amazing album uh, out on iTunes that you should check out. Here's their latest song called Monochrome Dreams. <laughs> Don't know what they 